Today, we will discuss plant mineral nutrition. We will start by talking about what minerals are essential for plant growth and also how we know this information. Then we will talk about how minerals are made available to plants and we will talk about the process of weathering which breaks down rocks into soil and we will talk about some different ways this can occur. We then will talk about different kinds of soil particles and the ability of each to hold on to minerals and water as well as to make space for air. Then we are going to talk about two symbioses or close relationships between plants and other organisms that help with mineral nutrition. First, we are going to talk about relationships between nitrogen fixing bacteria and plants and these make nitrogen available to plants in exchange for sugar. Second, we are going to talk about mycorrhizal relationships. We talked about this earlier in the semester. These are partnerships between a fungus or a mushroom and plants, and these allow phosphorus to be absorbed by the mycorrhizal, or rather by the fungus, and the fungus then exchanges the phosphorus with the plant in exchange for sugar. We will end today by talking about how we can manage nutrients in our gardens or other landscapes. There are 16 known essential elements that are necessary for plant growth. We will not talk about all of those. We will talk about the ones that are necessary in the largest quantities, as well as the ones that are most limiting to plant growth. So let's start by defining an essential element. Any element that must be present for a plant to grow, survive, and reproduce is called essential. There are some other elements that can benefit plant growth, but are not absolutely necessary. Out of the essential elements, we can divide them into two large categories. Macronutrients are nutrients that are required in large amounts. The prefix macro means large, and so this literally says large nutrients. And we will talk about um, several macronutrients. We then will talk about micronutrients. These are nutrients that are necessary, but they're necessary in much smaller amounts. We are not going to spend as much time talking about these. So let us next talk about how do we know that those 16 elements are necessary for plant growth. One way we know is that for many of the elements, we know what they do in the plant. So we have some understanding on a cell or molecular level of why that element is necessary and why the plant would be unable to survive without it. But we also know from doing experiments. When we do these experiments, we don't do them with real soil because real soil is going to have at least trace amounts of every um, element that plants need. Hence, we aren't going to be able to eliminate any of those elements and see if the plants can still survive. Instead, we'll use a hydroponics approach. Hydro means water. So hydroponics is the process of growing plants in a liquid medium without soil. And here's an image showing what hydroponics can look like. We have some containers that have a broth in it and the plants are growing out of that broth. We will add nutrients to the broth to give them, give the plants those nutrients they are not getting from soil because soil is absent. So because we are supplying the nutrients, we can make mixes with different elements and see in which mixes do the plants survive and in which ones do they fail to survive. And if the plants survive with a nutrient but fail to survive without it, that means that nutrient must be essential. It's worth noting here that we do this experiment in water and we're doing it in containers. A problem with this is that sometimes there will be a trace amount of an element in the water that we were unsuccessful in filtering out, or maybe some residue in the container. So it is possible that plants need more than those 16 elements we know of, and we have just never been successful 
in getting our containers clean enough and our water pure enough to eliminate the nutrient that they're getting unbeknownst to us. We're now going to talk about some of the macronutrients that are necessary in the largest quantities. And we will start with ones that do not come directly from the soil. Um, these are going to be carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, abbreviated by C, H, and O, respectively. And these three are by far the most important because these are the major components of all groups of macromolecules. So we've talked about carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and a little bit about nucleic acids. All four of those categories are made up primarily or exclusively of atoms of these three elements. Obviously then, without any of these three, the plant would fail to be able to do things like make sugars, and without being able to make sugars, it would be unable to survive. Let's talk a little bit about where the plant gets each of these nutrients. One source is carbon dioxide, which the plant takes in during photosynthesis. The other source is water, which is also taken in um, and incorporated during the process of photosynthesis. You can see carbon dioxide obviously has carbon in it, and so that's our source here. Water has hydrogen in it, so that's our source of hydrogen. And as it turns out, the oxygen that's in the macromolecules is coming from the carbon dioxide. It's not coming from this oxygen in water. This oxygen in water gets given off as the waste product of photosynthesis, and that is where we get our oxygen to breathe. There are several other macronutrients. The next three that we will discuss are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And we will start with potassium. Potassium has multiple roles in the cell. Two of the important roles are regulating water balance. This is done with the potassium ion, or K+. In other words, it's a positively charged ion, or a cation. And we talked in a recent lecture about how the plant controls the amount of water in cells by controlling the amount of solutes inside the cell compared to outside of the cell. And we said if the plant wants to take in more water, one thing it can do is move dissolved substances from outside of the cell to inside. Then by osmosis, water will follow along. It turns out that potassium is one of these ions that the plant actively moves into the cell or out of the cell, depending on what its water needs are. That's what we mean when we say it is used to regulate water balance. Potassium also serves a second role. In many cases, it's involved in turning enzymes on or enzymes off. And enzymes are, if you recall, proteins in the cell that are important for managing cellular reactions or making these reactions happen more quickly. And so the control over these enzymes is very important to cellular function. Another macronutrient is phosphorus, abbreviated simply by a P. And phosphorus is a component of two different macromolecules. First, it's a component of phospholipids, which is one subset of the lipids. You should recall that we looked at this when we talked about macromolecules. We saw that a phospholipid is a structure with a polar hydrophilic head group, in other words, something that likes to be near water. And we said there were two fatty acid tails that are nonpolar and like to stay away from water. When we talked about this macromolecule, we didn't really talk about what exactly was here, but it turns out that there's a phosphorus in this phosphate group that is part of the polar head group. Additionally, in DNA, that is a nucleic acid, which is another category of macromolecule. And the same phosphate group pictured here is a component of DNA. And in DNA, 
the phosphate group is involved with connecting monomers into long chains. We have not spent as much time talking about the structure of the monomers of DNA. It turns out that they are nucleotides and that our DNA is made out of incredibly long strands of nucleotides and each one of the nucleotides in the strand has a phosphate group connecting it to the next one. We'll talk about that in much more detail later. The next category of macromolecule that we will discuss is nitrogen. Nitrogen is a component of three different um, compounds that are important in cells. The first is amino acids, and you know that amino acids are the monomers of proteins. Again, we talked about this in the macromolecules lecture. Here's a diagram reminding you of this. What we can see here is a chain of what looks like beads. Each one of these beads is a single amino acid. And then if we zoom in on one of those, let's say um, this one right here, what we see is that there are several different um, atoms that make it up. And one set of those atoms has nitrogen as well as hydrogens in it. So you can see NH2 attached to this carbon right here. This is going to be in every one of these amino acids in the chain. So if the plant lacked nitrogen, it would be unable to make amino acids and therefore unable to make proteins. We've already talked about the fact that proteins are incredibly important for the cell because proteins are necessary both for enzymes and for um, transport as well as storage roles. Nitrogen is also a component of DNA, and DNA is necessary for storing hereditary information. Nitrogen also is a component of chlorophyll. We haven't talked about this yet, but you probably recall from um, biology in middle school or high school that chlorophyll is a pigment that is used to absorb light during photosynthesis. And so obviously, because photosynthesis is important to plants, having chlorophyll is important. We talked earlier about the importance of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, which are the most abundant elements in plants. But those are provided by either the air um, for carbon dioxide or by water. So we don't need to supply those nutrients um, in the soil. The next three that we've talked about were nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Those are nutrients that are taken up through the soil. And so these are the nutrients that are the most abundant in fertilizer. And these, these also are important because they tend to be the ones that are most limiting for plant growth. Out of these three, nitrogen is the one that usually limits plant growth followed by phosphorus and followed by potassium. That means that when we buy fertilizer, what we should be paying attention to is the amount of these three items. If you look at just about any fertilizer product, you will see three numbers like shown here in order with dashes in between them. The units are esoteric and a little bit antiquated, so we won't worry about what the exact numbers mean, but larger numbers here mean more, and these numbers will always be in the same order. It is always NPK, or nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. There are an additional three, three more macronutrients, and there are seven micronutrients, um, none of which we talked about. Your book lists all of them and also gives you a brief description of why each of those is necessary. We are going to switch gears here and talk about how soil is made and hence how these minerals are made available to plants. Minerals are released from rock during the process of weathering. During weathering, we, are going to, we will start with something like a boulder or bedrock and it's going to be progressively broken down into smaller and smaller particles. An early step of that is seen here where this large rock has cracked 
into some smaller pieces, and you can imagine that process going forward into progressively smaller bits until we get down to pebbles or gravel, and eventually particles that are small enough we will consider them part of the soil. Out of the soil-sized particles, there are three, and they go in order from largest to smallest, as sand as largest, silt being medium, and clay being the smallest particles. We'll talk a little bit more about weathering, then we will talk about the properties of these particles. Weathering can happen by either physical or chemical processes and plants can be involved in both the physical and the chemical processes. In physical weathering, there's breakdown by direct contact. What that means is that something contacts the rock and acts upon it in order to split it or at least impart forces that will eventually split it. Here are a couple of examples to make that more clear. One way this is, can happen is if water enters cracks in the rock, then, um, as you know if you've ever made ice cubes, as water freezes, it expands. And so you could imagine that if there was water in this crack and it froze, it would expand outward and that would put a force on the rock that would um, potentially cause it to split. And so a crack like this could widen. This can also happen due to biological causes. If either a plant root or a fungus were to grow into this crack, and then as the root or fungal strand expanded, it would also impart a force that could further crack the rock. So that's an example, or those are a couple of examples of physical weathering. Chemical weathering may also occur. This is when chemical interactions remove minerals from a rock, or break small particles down into even smaller particles. This can happen due to purely chemical um, interactions without anything living, but they can also be facilitated by living things. This is particularly true because plant roots and fungi can release acids into the environment. As you know, acids contain protons, or hydrogen ions, and these have the ability to undergo a variety of chemical reactions that can have the effect of releasing minerals from a rock or from soil particles. When these minerals get released, then they can become dissolved in water and they can be removed. So one effect of this is that it will break the rock or the particles into smaller pieces. But the second effect of this is that the released minerals will then be available in a form that plants can use, because if they are dissolved in water, plants are able to take in water in the process of transpiration. You can see in this picture some lichens. Lichens are a symbiotic association that can be important in forming soil. Lichens specifically are symbiotic associations between fungi and either algae or photosynthetic bacteria. In other words, between something that is able to photosynthesize. And as you can see here, they can be green, although they can also be other colors. These associations and lichens are important because lichens are able to grow on bare rock surfaces, such as pictured here. You might also see them on concrete monuments or buildings. Because lichens can inhabit bare rock, they are able to start the process of weathering. They are the fungi that is part of the lichen will be able to send out strands or hyphae into the rock surface um, to attach, and the lichens can release acids, which, as we just talked about, can start the process of breaking down the rock. That means that lichens contribute to the process of weathering, and because they are releasing um, soil or they're releasing mineral particles, 
they can also contribute to the process of soil formation. We will now talk a little bit about the properties of the three soil particles I already mentioned, which were sand, silt, and clay. We said that they have different sizes. It turns out that the different sizes relate to their ability to hold water and to create environments that have adequate air and adequate nutrients for plant growth. We'll go through each of these, starting with sand. So sand is pictured here on the left. You can see the particles are large. The blue circle around each particle represents water. And what I want you to do is look at sand, silt, and clay all at once, and notice in which of these diagrams is there the most color blue. What you should notice is that there's more blue associated with the clay and progressively less with silt and sand. That is an indication that sand is less able to hold water than either silt or clay. This isn't a surprise if you've ever done something like build a sand castle. As soon as you pour water into the sand, it almost immediately is going to seep away. Um, so the reason that sand is not very good at holding water is that the soil particles are large here. And remember that water is going to stick to the surface. It turns out that a large particle has more surface area than the small one, but we also have many fewer of those particles within the same area of space. And the total amount of surface area on which water can stick turns out to be smaller for large particles like sand than it is for small particles like clay. Again, you see that in that there is a lot of brown in this diagram, while there's a lot of blue in this part of the diagram. Sand then has less surface area per unit volume, and so it's less able to hold on to water. For similar reasons, because nutrients tend to stick to soil particles, and because sand has less surface area per unit volume, sand is less able to hold on to nutrients. Sand is really good at having large pores, which it will be useful for allowing air to penetrate through. The problem with large pores is that it's going to also allow water to easily escape. So you can imagine after a rainstorm, water will percolate through and drain away quickly. That means that unless it rains constantly, pretty quickly the plants are going to be in an environment lacking water. Silt is our intermediate particle and it has intermediate properties. It has a medium surface area relative to the volume and it has a medium ability to hold on to water and nutrients. It also has medium-sized pores for water drainage. So you can see there's a smaller downward arrow right here. It does have air pores present. They are not as large as in sand, but they are larger than in clay. Clay is the smallest of our three particles. And as you can guess and you can see, Clay has the largest amount of surface area per unit of volume. That means it has the highest ability to hold on to both water and nutrients. So that's good. Some problems with this is that the water sticks really well to the clay particles. So even though there's a lot of water, it's not always easy for the plant to pull that water off of the clay. It's easier to do that on the larger particles. There are really small pores in clay. This is a problem because it's hard for water to escape. It's true that that means the soil will dry out less quickly. However, the soil can remain waterlogged. And the problem with waterlogged soil is that we don't have adequate access to air. Remember that plant roots need air because they need to perform respiration. And so without air, the plant roots can suffer or even die, which has obvious bad effects for the plant as a whole. It, it turns out that a mix of the three sizes of soil particles is better than the soil composed of any one of the three alone. The name for a mix of soil particles is a loam. And a good loam has relatively similar amounts 
of all three of these, sand, silt, and clay. A loam is going to combine the good properties of each ingredient. So a loamy soil will drain adequately, but it will have enough small particles that it can also hold on to adequate amounts of soil moisture um, for the plants. It will drain quickly enough that there will be pores available for air most of the time, and so the plant roots will be able to perform respiration. And because loam has some clay and salt particles, it will be reason reasonably good at holding on to nutrients. This means that if you are looking to buy farmland or you're looking for um, property for a garden, then a very desirable attribute is having loamy soil. Another element that's important for soil is not just the soil particles, but organic matter within the soil. Technically, a soil includes both minerals and decayed organic matter. It has to have both of these. Something that is just minerals would be called dirt, but it would not fit the definition of soil. And organic matter in soil is important for multiple reasons. First, organic matter contains nutrients, and so as the nutrients, or rather, as the organic matter gets broken down, then those nutrients become released during the process of decomposition. This means that effectively organic matter provides fertilizer. A second reason is that nutrients stick to the surface of or decayed organic matter in the soil, much in the same way that they stick to the surface of sand, silt, and clay particles. Because we don't want um, nutrients to wash away, then having some substance that the nutrients can stick to is going to help conserve them in the soil. Third, a uh, more esoteric reason organic matter is important is that organic matter can be extremely sticky and it can stick clay particles together um, to form groups of particles. And it turns out that sort of like loam is good for having favorable properties. Soil that is stuck together into slightly larger clumps interspersed with smaller particles is ideal for good growing conditions. This won't always happen if we don't have organic matter. And with organic matter, it tends to happen more effectively. We've talked a little bit about um, phosphorus and potassium. Both of those nutrients come directly from the breakdown of minerals during weathering. We need to talk about nitrogen separately because the cycle that provides nitrogen to growing plants is very different. It does not involve the weathering of rock. Instead, we're going to see that nitrogen in the soil comes originally from nitrogen gas in the air. Nitrogen is especially important because it's usually the nutrient that most limits plant growth. Ironically, or surprisingly, air is 78% nitrogen, but from the plant's perspective, it's missing entirely because the plant is not able to use the nitrogen in the air. Instead, what needs to occur is that bacteria in the soil first need to convert that atmospheric nitrogen into a usable form. And the usable form that is most directly formed is ammonia. The process of fixing atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia is called nitrogen fixation. It's been fixed into a useful form for living things. Ammonia then can be converted into nitrate, which is another form that is commonly used by plants. The bacteria that do this process of nitrogen fixation can live freely in the soil. However, bacteria also associate with legumes, and legumes are a group of eudicots. It's specifically a family of eudicots. And almost unique to the legumes is the ability to have a symbiotic relationship with nitrogen fixing bacteria that allows those bacteria to live in the roots and to fix nitrogen.
There are a few other plant groups that do this, but legumes are far and away the most important. In this symbiosis, remember a symbiosis is a close association, the bacteria are literally going to live within these nodules that occur on the roots of the plants. And this is a nutrient exchange symbiosis. So the plant is providing the bacteria inside these nodules, first um, sugar, and second it's providing it an ideal environment to fix nitrogen. In exchange, the bacteria is going to change atmospheric nitrogen into a form that the plant can use and it will pass it along to the plant. This relationship between bacteria and legumes is incredibly important for humans. Um, one reason is that it benefits our food supply. We've said in an earlier lecture that seeds from plants tend to be high in protein. It turns out that this is especially true for legume seeds. Or put another way, legumes, because they have an extra source of protein, are able to make a lot of seeds more than they could make if they did not have this association with nitrogen fixing bacteria. So some example of seeds that we get from legumes, anything that's a bean from a green bean to a kidney bean to a pinto bean is a kind of legume. Lentils and peas are both kinds of legumes as are peanuts. And then some processed foods made from uh, legumes include hummus. Let me fix the spelling here. Hummus, which is made usually from chickpeas or garbanzo beans, the same thing. That's these right here, as well as tofu, which is made from soybeans. So if you know any vegetarians, they probably eat a lot of things on this list. The symbiosis with nitrogen fixing bacteria is also important in agriculture especially before the advent of synthetic fertilizers, then we would commonly use an approach of cover cropping. So this is when we would let a field be fallow or unused for a period of time. And we would plant in it oftentimes a legume, um, something like either alfalfa or clover, and let it sit for a season or a year. During this time, the plants would form associations with bacteria the bacteria would fix nitrogen. Some of that nitrogen would end up in the soil, and a lot of it would end up in the plants. Then once the plants were grown, the plants would be plowed into the soil. Those nutrients then would become available as the plant decomposed, and that extra nitrogen would be there for whatever crop it is that, you, that the farmer would grow in the next year. Another traditional way this um, symbiotic association is used in agriculture is intercropping. This term refers to when different crops are grown in close proximity such that they can benefit each other. In a traditional, um, in some traditional Native American agriculture, there would be corn planted, so corn is this large plant in the middle, along with beans, and you can see the beans are vining up on the corn plant, like right here, as well as squash near the ground. And here are some bean leaves right here. Again, in this situation, because the beans have nitrogen fixing bacteria, those bacteria will fix nitrogen, some of which is going to leak out into the soil and be available for the corn and the squash. The squash is helpful in keeping weeds down and preventing weeds from then overtaking the corn. That then is all that we will say about how plants acquire nitrogen and how some plants partner with nitrogen fixing bacteria. The next symbiotic association that we will discuss is mycorrhizae. This again is when a plant partners with a fungus. It turns out that fungi are better than plants at acquiring phosphorus from the soil. Um, there's a few reasons for this. One is that the hyphae, or the strands of fungus, are smaller and better able to get through very small spaces in the soil. And other reasons for this are more chemical in nature. 
because phosphorus is so important to plants, the fungus will exchange phosphorus to the plant. In exchange for this, the plant provides the fungus with sugars. The exchange of phosphorus and sugars happens where fungi attach to plant roots. And you can see an example here where this is the plant root that's the darker brown, but everywhere that's this lighter, almost white color, is a place where a fungus is completely growing over the surface of the root. It turns out that the hyphae from the fungus actually grow in between the cells in the cortex of the root, and it's in those areas that nutrient exchange occurs. In some other kinds of mycorrhizae, the hyphae of the fungus literally go inside some cells of the plant, and they exchange nutrients inside the plant cells. You can see some mushrooms here. These happen to be poisonous mushrooms. These are the fruiting bodies of a fungus that is um, in a mycorrhizal association with plants. We talked earlier in the semester about the fact that land plants were mycorrhizal or had these associations, even at the earliest time. I think we have fossil evidence for this. We also know that liverworts, which are the relatives of the first plants to colonize land, liverworts have connections with fungi, as do other early diverging land plants. That then suggests to us that perhaps the very first land plants also had connections with fungi. Why is this so important? Well, remember that plants are needed to build soil because they contribute to weathering and they also contribute organic matter, which is necessary for material to be called soil. So then we have a chicken and egg question. If plants were to colonize land, but they need soil, but plants are necessary to make soil, then how did the first plants colonize land? It is very likely that part of the secret to this is that when the first plants were colonizing land, they already had fungal connections and the fungi were helping them get nutrients that they would have been very poor at getting in those early environments. And if we think back to the lichens, we can see an analogy for this, where we have, in this case, not plants, but we have photosynthetic organisms living in association with fungi and therefore being able to get nutrients in what's otherwise a very challenging environment. We are going to end today's lecture by thinking a little bit about how we can use this information. Many of us are interested in soil nutrients because we are trying to grow plants. This could be just for the aesthetic value or it could be because we want to produce food if we're growing um, edible garden plants. For people who are avid gardeners, it is really important to understand what nutrients are abundant in the soil and which nutrients are either not abundant or not able to be released because of soil chemistry. And this can get pretty complicated pretty quickly. Luckily, there are some ways to find out. If you go to a garden store, you can buy home test kits. These will let you test for things like nitrogen or phosphorus, and also to determine your soil's pH. So that's not a bad place to start. If it was me, I would instead suggest contacting your state extension office. In South Carolina, you would look for a Clemson extension, and if you just type that into Google, type Clemson Extension Soil Testing, and you will find this page where they describe all of their services. And what you can see is that for a cheap price, maybe five or six dollars, you can get soil tests completed. Um, and they will be able to give you a breakdown of which of the essential nutrients are there in large quantities and which ones you would need to supplement to have ideal plant growth. There are some other tests that you can do. You can feel the soil. And again, if you Google this, you'll find explicit instructions for how to do this. But doing a simple test with your hand 
will allow you to determine whether you have an appropriate mix of sand, salt, and clay in your soil. If you don't, then you could bring in additional soil, you could add organic matter to help compensate, or you could find somewhere else to garden. You can also look at the soil and determine some features. In South Carolina, we commonly will see a red color to the soil, so-called red clay. Unfortunately, the red color indicates that the soil is old. Because South Carolina has not been glaciated, at least in any of the recent glaciations, our soil has not been replaced. That means that as weathering has occurred, many of the nutrients have already been used up. Our sand and our silt have broken down to clay, and now our soil doesn't have very much nutrients available to plants. Um, this means that we have to be especially careful about supplying nutrients. You can also look at the darkness of the soil. A lighter colored soil means there's less organic matter, and a dark colored soil means that there's more. If you have a chocolatey brown soil, that's a very good sign. That probably means there's abundant organic matter. And organic matter is something that you can add by purchasing organic matter or by making it yourself. And so I will talk a little bit about making compost. Compost is decayed um, plant scraps that can be from the yard or for our case, that can be from the kitchen. And so what you can see here in the compost bin is basically there's a lid and you can take the lid off and deposit your vegetable scraps into the top. You can also see that over time, the vegetable scraps will break down and you eventually will get something that looks like soil. It's not true soil because there's no minerals. There's only decayed organic matter down here. But this will be a high nutrient um, amendment that you can add to gardens to both increase nutrients and provide those other benefits that we already talked about organic matter providing. A nice plus to composting is that any food that you put into your compost bin is food that your municipality does not need to haul away and pay the store in the landfill. And so it is a win-win situation. Um, a bin like this can be found um, through Spartanburg County. If you contact the landfill, they can tell you more about that. Or you can buy them somewhere like a garden store. Some final thoughts for today's lecture. First, appropriate nutrition is very important for successful plant growth. Second, um, if you are interested in growing your own food, then composting your food waste is a great way of being able to augment the nutrition in your garden. Third, nutrients are depleted in old soils so as we just talked about, in some areas like the tropics and like South Carolina, agriculture is more challenging than in Midwestern soils that are more rich, for example. And finally, one thought about adding fertilizer as a way of increasing soil nutrients if you are gardening. This can be successful um, for your yard or for your garden. But please keep in mind that when you add soil nutrients, if it rains sometime afterwards or if you add too much, then those nutrients are going to run off and eventually end up in a local stream or river, and eventually those will run into larger bodies of water. And the extra fertilizer there can allow extra algal growth to occur. We talked about that much earlier in the semester with respect to red tides. Generally, we don't want extra algal growth in our water bodies, and so if you do use fertilizer at home, make sure to use it in a responsible manner.